I just want to take a second to honor you um, for your strength, for your heart, and for your ministry, and for the calling that you have chosen to say yes to, because I know that it's making many others, including myself, continue to say yes. Uh, Pastor Matt, I want to take a second to honor you, uh, your boldness, um, your teachings. You have taught me so much in just the amount of time that I've been a part of the Father's house. Same with you, Trin. I know when you get on stage, you're coming with the sword, you're saying something fiery, and it's here to light the hearts of all of God's people. So I want to say keep going, keep going, keep going. It is helping, it is healing, it is happiness, it is joy. Um, thank you. Thank you both. God bless you. One way that Pastor Matt, Pastor Trina have impacted my life is their willing hearts. They have very open hearts to love on everyone and they're willing to meet you halfway and help you achieve your spiritual goals. Even though there's a lot of moving parts to the church, they give you one-on-ones and I appreciate that. Um, Pastor Matt, Pastor Trina, we love you so much and we appreciate everything you do for us. Pastors are overworked and underappreciated, but please know that your church loves you. God bless. Pastor Matt, Pastor Trina are exceptional people to me. As a young man, they helped me to see God for the first time. But beyond that, their heart has given me a heart. I can't tell you how many times when I'm struggling and I'm confused and I'm just at my wit's end, they've given me hope and like I said, they help me see God every time. Um, Pastor Matt and Pastor Trina has enriched my life in so many ways. Um, in the short time that I have known them, I would describe them as um, encouraging, thoughtful, supportive, welcoming, and kind. Um, they have shown me grace and they have helped me on this journey with Christ and um, has showed up during some of the worst times in, in my life. Um, I just want to thank you, Pastor Matt and Pastor Trina, for everything. And it reminds me of the verse, um, 1 Thessalonians uh, 5, through 5, 12 through 13. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. That is for you, Pastor Matt and Trina. When I first came to TFH and Thomas, I was in probably the darkest season of my entire life. Uh, for those who know me, then you know I was suicidal. Um, I had had a breakdown where I wasn't doing anything for about uh, two and a half years. I wasn't working. I wasn't going outside, really. I just was stewing in my depression. and. Pastor Matt and Trina believed in me. They gave me a chance when no one else did. And because of their faithfulness, my entire life is now different. Uh, I have a job. Also, thank you, Pastor Mike, for that. I have a job. I have um, a, a loving family by choice, and that is uh, our team at Father South of the and our church as a whole. And I just... I'm happier than I've ever been in my entire life. I can honestly say that they saved my life, that I would not be here if it wasn't for the Father South and Thomas and Pastor Matt and Pastor Trina in particular. So Pastor Matt and Pastor Trina have been extremely influential in my life. Um, for example, when I first stepped foot, step foot in the Father's house, um, I felt this immediate warmth, welcoming presence um, that has changed completely my family. Uh, I want to like speak lots of gratitude for their guidance and for their love. Um, I felt extremely lost and I didn't actually feel a part of a church uh, until I stepped into the Father's house in Thomas. Um, quite frankly, like my sister's life has changed. My mom and my nieces, um, they have taught us 
how to grow as leaders, and they just loved us. Um, probably one of the uh, profoundest memories is when uh, my mom uh, and my sister got sick this year, and I was completely lost. Uh, and so what had happened was uh, Pastor Trina had came to the hospital and she prayed over my mom and it's it was so beautiful and when my sister was sick like all of the family everyone had came together and um, donated meals for us <laughs> and I just want to thank you so much for your love and um, generosity and just being a part of the family. There's so much I could say about Pastor Matt and Trina and in reflecting about who they have been to me, the thing that sticks out the most is when I was new and going through a hard time, Pastor Trina said to me, just come and be family for a while. And I knew that they meant it and I really felt it. So thank you for being family and helping me get through a really rough time and being able to have all these great times in this house with you guys and I love you. Pastor Matt and Pastor Trina have been a huge blessing to us, to me and my family. First and foremost, I, I thank them for being as humble as they are. Um, let's be real, me and Pastor Trina were pretty much the same person. Uh, <laughs> we both found Jesus in the middle of the hood, so um, I'm super thankful for her. She's such a great person, funny person. Um, Pastor Matt is just, he just has such a humble soul. Um, that family welcomed my family into this place. They didn't know us. They introduced us to everybody. This church has just become a home because of these leaders. We thank, uh, we thank God for these leaders in my household, at least, you know. We, we love them and we appreciate you, Pastor Matt, Pastor Trina. Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, I just thank God for you guys. You, there's no words. I will never break your heart. I everlasting Father. This is that Jesus will be everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. I know I'm Maybe you need peace in your life tonight. And it's my time. I'll serve you all my life. I know I'm chosen for something.
Praise the Lord. All right. As my beautiful assistants and my wonderful nephew come up on the stage. And if we can have Pastor Matt and Trina come up as well and give them a hand as they make their way up. And we here are presenting you gifts from those who've given towards your um, pastor's appreciation, and there is more to come. And there's also a table back there if you want to write them a special note or even bless them with something very special, you know, like a Pentecostal handshake. And so, <laughs> Pastor Matt and Trina, I love you guys so very much. Um, thank you for sharing God and loving Jesus the way you do. Um, thank you for sharing your family. Um, I love you guys very much. Pastor Matt, Pastor Matt, I don't know if you know this, but he was my youth pastor too. And so I've been blessed and honored to be under your leadership um, since I was a wee lass. And so, <laughs> and so I thank you, Matt. I, I even mentioned this to Mike one time. I go, I used to, when you used to have your studio in the church, I would see your notes just, you know, laying around, and I would clean, I'd be there cleaning the church, and I would see your notes, and I would grab your notes, and I would pretend I was you looking in the mirror. And I was like, Lord, anoint me like my pastor. <laughs> Trina, I thank you for your friendship. When I was new to the church, I did not know where to go. I just stood there, but I saw you. You stood out. And I was like, I'm going to approach her. And I went up to you, and I said, can I hang with you? Without hesitation, you said yes. And ever since that day, my life has not been the same. I love you, and I thank you for being you. Thank you for blessing me with these three babies. Truly, I love them so very much. And as I call um, Pastor Jim up, we're going to say a prayer over you in church. Um, let's give Pastor Jim a hand as he makes his way up. Praise the Lord. Church, can we all extend our hands as a symbol of blessing and agreement and prayer? Um, unless you've been in the pastoral role, um, it's, it's a unique calling and a very difficult calling. A calling of joy, but a calling that comes with a lot of suffering. Because when you're ministering to people, they come in very wounded. Until they're healed, they often wound. And they wound those that try to love them. And no one tries to love them more than the pastors. So they carry their share of wounds. I do over many years of inner city ministry, but the grace of God has always been sufficient and will be sufficient for all of us through the good times, the bad times, the in-between times. Let's pray that the Lord will strengthen them because we're having, in America, we're having a high burnout rate among pastors. More pastors are leaving the ministry and churches closing than people willing to respond to the calling. So we need to cover them, cover them in your prayers every day, will you? Because the enemy will seek to, to divide and destroy, to attack the marriage, their children. We need to pray God's protective hedge of covering over them because they become the primary targets because if the enemy can get them to fail or to fall into morality or their marriage to break up, it affects the whole church and the sheep get scattered because they get hurt. So let's pray that that will never be a possibility with this couple. Amen. They'll be in for the long haul until Jesus comes back. Praise the Lord. Let's go. Father, we come before you in the mighty, blessed name of Jesus. Lord, you know how precious this couple is to all of us, to me personally, Lord. Lord, I remember when my mama prophesied when Matt was only a two, two months old as a baby of the calling upon his life to be a preacher of the gospel. I remember when Trina came in as a troubled teenager at 14 years of age into our church. And at the foolishness of the preaching of the gospel on that Wednesday night service, she received Christ and was born again. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God when it's preached under your anointing still impacts and changes lives. Thank you for the fruit that's been born through many years of trials and tribulations, of love and fellowship and sharing and serving. Bless them, Lord. Bless them. 30, 60, 100 fold with every spiritual and material blessing on high. Lord, strengthen them for the work ahead. The work ahead is great and grand because we ain't seen nothing yet. So we thank you that together we're going to partner together. We're going to 
uphold their arms when they grow weary because they will, will grow weary. We're going to uphold their arms with words of encouragement, with prayer, with a hug, with just being friends. As, as Moses and Aaron upheld the arms of Moses when he was getting weary in the battle, we will uphold their arms. Lord, we commit to do this because if we uphold their arms and they are strengthened, we will in turn be strengthened in our times of difficulty and trial and tribulation that we will have in this life. Lord, we're so cognizant that the scripture says through many sufferings, we must enter the kingdom of God. But in those sufferings, when they're given to you, will bring blessing and strength and growth into our lives. That no suffering can overcome us because you have told us that because you have overcome, we with your power will overcome as well. Thank you for that promise and that blessing that these, this young couple will continue faithfully in the service and work of the ministry, my God, and shepherding souls, and making disciples and training leaders. And we'll see churches planted, missionaries sent. We'll see harvests of souls come into the kingdom that would not have, but because they've been faithful and obedient to the call, we will see the fruitfulness of that in greater days and days ahead. Lord, bless them. Strengthen their marriage. Protect their marriage, Lord. I know the enemy is trying to, to bring havoc to Christian marriages, especially those that serve in Christian ministry. Protect their marriage. Keep them always glued together, Lord Jesus. Lord, be always the glue that keeps them glued together for a lifetime of love and service that their household would never be visited by the pain of separation or divorce, my God, but will be always a united love. And even in differences and disagreements, they'll come to agreement as they hear each other's heart and communicate clearly. Bless their children, my God. May their children be protected by you, Lord. Lord, that their hearts will be tender to Jesus. And they'll have the same love for you, Lord, as their parents do. And they'll grow in the strength and grace of God to fulfill their callings and find their place in ministry and in the life of the church. Bless this family as only you can. Strengthen them and protect them, my God. And may they be blessed this day and every single day, even the days of challenge and trials and problems. Let them receive grace and strength that comes from heaven above. Let them be encouraged and let them know it's going to be, as, as mama would have told them, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And it always was. Maybe not the way we wanted it to, but it always turned out all right because things always turn out all right for your children as we put our faith and trust in you. We pray this blessing now together, united. We stand the promise of the gospel of St. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19. If two or more of your people stand as touching and agreeing on anything, it will be done by our Heavenly Father. We are agreeing and we're praying. We know in your perfect will for blessing upon this family and precious couple. So we're praying in our perfect will. So we agree it's being sealed by our Heavenly Father to be manifested this day and all the days ahead with your blessing, with your wisdom, with your strength, with the power of your Holy Spirit, your anointing, and Lord, your peace and joy in the work of the ministry. We thank you. We ask these things as our brothers and sisters together, we agree together. We ask these things in an agreement. We say amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a big, big hand of praise. Amen. Amen. We are blessed here at TFH and Thomas for many reasons, but not the least of which is we are blessed with four amazing, faithful, dedicated pastors, Pastor Matt, Pastor Trina, Dr. Jim, and also, as you'll get to hear from this morning, Pastor Mike. So would you stand with me this morning and let's welcome up Pastor Mike as he delivers the word. Hello, good morning. How are you guys doing today? Well, we're going to stand in reverence for the word of God as we read 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. And I want to honor our pastors today. 
uh, it, I'll tell you a story in just a moment, a good story. <laughs> I've got a lot of them, <laughs> depending on the, the subject that you want to hear about. I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of stories. You want to hear happy stories? I've got them. You want to hear sad stories? I've got them. You want to hear funny stories? And they're all funny in their own way. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, and it says this. It says, the elders, we call them pastors nowadays, who lead well are to be considered worthy of double honor. That word honor in the Greek language means pay, wages, compensation, double pay, double wages, double compensation. Especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while it is threshing and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. We pray that you would bless this message with your presence, that no life would leave untouched or unchanged. Holy Spirit, that you would have your way. We invite you now, even as we sense you already moving in the different rooms and the different nooks and crannies of our hearts, we invite you to continue to move in your own special way. For these things, Lord, we thank you. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody says, amen and amen. Give your neighbor a high five, and then you may be seated today. This is the the building. I want to show I want to show you guys that and I was in the middle of honoring our pastors and so I'm, I want to continue with that thought but I didn't want to keep you guys standing all morning. So you don't have it? Uh okay. So anyway, if you guys haven't seen check out our what we're still praying and believing and working towards being our future church building that we're not we're almost in the middle of our due diligence process, which is 60 days, and uh, so we're doing everything that we can, and we're just ple- believing, praying, and hoping. How many believe that we'll have a, a permanent church home? Yeah. Especially the projection guys, they're always clapping and <laughs> believing for that, and more set up and tear down. So we're continuing with our series, Welcome Home, and I want to honor them today because I remember when I was 15 years old, it seems like only yesterday, but it was actually 25 years ago. You're like, you can't, I can't believe that. I, I can't either. It, it still feels like it was only yesterday. 15 years old, teenager, you know, didn't know a thing about a thing. I didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, pimply faced and pimples in places I didn't even know existed and that kind of stuff. You, you guys remember those days? I do. Um, and so... I remember that my brother came back from this place called the Urban Training Center where we taught evangelism and prayer and sacrifice and supporting our pastors and all these good qualities, basically discipleship. And he came back and I was like, what did you do with my brother? This is not the same guy that I remember three months ago. What did you do to him? Did you brainwash him? Did you cast a spell on him? What did, who is this guy who all he wants to do is go out to the different neighborhoods, the worst part of town, mind you, and preach the gospel in places where people don't want to go? In places where there's murders, in places where there's gang violence, where there's drug deals, where there's prostitution, where there's all the things that self-respecting folks don't want to do in places we don't want to go. So there I was, 15 years old, and he comes back, and my dad goes to him, or my mom, or both, probably a team effort. They said, we need, for, we need to do two things. Number one, we need to lead worship. Okay, check. And then a little while later, we need to start a youth group because we got all these teenagers, and there's nowhere to put them. We got no class, no nothing for them. So there, there we were, and naturally, you know, being the next in line, my brother's two years older than I am, we just did whatever it is that he said to do. So when he said that we're going to go down Northgate Boulevard in the middle of the night and run down Northgate Boulevard with a bunch of neon signs, bullhorn, and flyers screaming, Jesus loves you, and he has a plan for your life, and talking to homeless people and talking to drug addicts and gang members and, you know, people who ordinarily we would not talk to, we said, okay, right? Because we didn't know any better. We didn't know what we didn't know. So there I was, 15 years old, and when Pops, when our pastor, our dad, asked 
us to do something, we didn't know any better. We said, okay, sure. The word no did not exist in our vocabulary. We learned how to not only honor God, but we honor God by honoring our leaders, by honoring those who we had placed to take care of our souls. And continuing with our series, Welcome Home, we're going to talk about honoring the man of the house. Honoring the man of the house. And in 1 Timothy chapter 5, we see that the Apostle Paul talks about honor, double honor. Well, in the original Greek language, like I said, it means double pay, double compensation. But it also means to value, respect, or highly esteem, to treat as precious, weighty, or valuable. And so that's what we do. That's what we do with those God has placed over us. Over us in the sense that they carry more responsibility, more weight, more pressure. In a good sense, though. And here's the setting. Paul is writing to his young disciple, his young student, Timothy. Now, Timothy, mind you, he... Paul would refer to him as my only true son in the faith. Timothy was not an old guy. He was in his late teens, early 20s. And he was far from home. Anyone been far from home, been homesick before? Timothy was 400 miles away from his hometown. The Apostle Paul gets this bright idea. Hey, Timothy, since we have this church over here in the city of Ephesus, Ephesus was 400 miles away from Timothy's hometown, it would have taken Timothy almost three weeks of traveling all day long because they didn't have cars, they didn't have planes, they didn't have buses, they didn't have trains, they didn't have roads in most part of the world at that time to travel to get back home to mama. Timothy was a mama's boy. Got a lot of mama's boys nowadays. I won't bust you out right now, but... Timothy was far from home. And so Paul gets this bright idea. Hey, Timothy, I'm going to send you 400 miles away, basically from here to Los Angeles, that distance. I'm going to send you all the way over there to take over this church. Being the youngest guy there and being young and single and strapping young man that you are, I'm going to send you into the lion's den, the city of Ephesus. Now, Ephesus was known for having one of the seven wonders of the world which was the temple to the goddess Diana, the moon goddess. And men would come from all throughout the world to be amazed at this temple of Diana because it was spectacular. It was beautiful. But they wouldn't just marvel at its exterior, but they would go and worship inside the temple. Now, uh, for some reason nowadays, we... I, there's certain things that I can't say, even though Netflix says it all the time and Disney Plus says it, but I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it PG-13 today because it was very graphic, the things that they would go in to the temple to do. Because these temple priestesses, we would know them as prostitutes, would engage in worship to the moon god is Diana and do the most... Terrible, terrible acts in that place. And so Paul gets this bright idea. Let me send the youngest guy that I know, the most single guy that I know, the mama's boy, the one who I can't trust anybody else because I've got a bunch of older, knuckleheaded dudes who think they know better than I do. So I'm going to send the youngest guy possible, Timothy, to the city of Ephesus, far away from home. What a great, what could go wrong? So Timothy is in a sex-crazed city, one of the most sex-crazed cities in the entire known world at the time, and he's there, and Paul's writing to him. First of all, Timothy had to have a great sense of honor for the Apostle Paul to say yes to that mission to begin with. Because he knew that he was going into a situation that was not going to be easy. Sometimes God sends us into a difficult situation not to harm us, but to help us. Sometimes God puts us in a place of great despair and hardship and heartache, not because he wants to destroy us, but because he wants to build us into the people that we were always meant to be. Sometimes we question and we say, oh, God, you placed me in a situation like Job. Uh Uh-uh. Don't use that. 
Because Job was a righteous man. And God was bragging on him and placing him in a hard situation because God wanted to prove that Job was his honor student. And sometimes it, God's not placing us in a situation where he's placing us there to damage us, but he's placing us there to build us and to prove that we have the goods to honor his purpose for our lives. Sometimes we question God's process. Sometimes we look at it and we say, God, why are you doing it this way? But we're asking the wrong question. Don't ask God why, ask God what. God, what are you seeking to develop in me? Or what are you seeking to take away from me? Not why, because I don't know as much as you do, and I'll never know as much as you do. You, your plans are greater than mine could ever be. And you see the beginning from the end. So what I'm going to do, God, is I'm just going to trust that you have it all taken care of. Man, there were plenty of times, plenty of times in this journey that Pastor Matt and Trina questioned whether they were really called to this thing. God, why have you placed us here? God, why would you not allow this mantle of your calling to go to somebody else? Just pick somebody else, not us anymore. Because it gets difficult. It gets tough. It gets rough. It gets bumpy. It gets rocky. You've got the enemy coming at you from all sides, enemies that you didn't even know existed before. And you start to question, God, why would you not choose that guy over there? Like, choose somebody who is not me. <laughs> Just not me. Let it pass to somebody else. But in those moments, it was like with Jeremiah. I can't stop speaking because it's like fire in my bones. I can't stop talking and ministering your word because you've given this to me for a reason. And in those moments... It was God who was saying, no, I'm not going to let you off the hook because there's too many people who I want you to impact. See, some of us have asked God to let somebody else do it, but he keeps on bringing it back to us and putting the back ball back in our court and saying, no, <laughs> I'm not asking somebody else. I'm asking you. I don't want somebody else. I want you. I've chosen you. I've called you. So like he told the Apostle Paul, it's painful for you to resist my will. It's easier for you to just surrender. And for some of us, we've run from the call of God on our lives. We've said no. We've resisted for a long time. We're like Jonah. We ran, oh, we ran in the total opposite direction of where God wanted us to be. And he's like, I'm going to bring you full circle because I love you too much to let you stay as you are. I want to bring you up to a higher level. I want to bring you up to the place where you're always supposed to be. And for some of us, God is calling you not necessarily at this moment in time to his call on your life, but he's calling you into a relationship. Now, one thing that we have experienced is the God that we serve is too beautiful and too wonderful to not serve. In all the places, and, and I've done the research, man. I've done the research into Buddhism and Shintoism and Taoism, and you name the religion, and I've done it. And I'm like, these things are all confusing. You got like 997,000 gods. How in the world are you going to figure out which one is which? Like, what if you make a sacrifice to the wrong God on the wrong day, and the sacrifice you were supposed to make to this God ends up turning out to be the wrong one, and so you actually bring judgment? On that's too confusing. We got one. I'm like, that's way easier. I could do it. I, I can have one. 997,000? I, I can't do that. And then I've got nothing to look forward to after this life? The grave is it? Or... If I live a good enough life, then I can come back as a kitty cat or a doggy. I'm not about that life. You know, it's like, no, no, come on. I mean, you know, kitty cats and doggies, are, they're pretty good, but I'm not going to be walking on all fours and, you know, eating whiskers and things out of, the, you know, cans and, you know, licking myself all day. I'm 
not about that life. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, some of us know some people who are, oh, never mind. I better not, I better not say. See, I'm, and crazier things than that come into my mind as I'm speaking. And so I'm like, if I say that, I will never be invited back ever again. Because <laughs> church, there's WikiLeaks, but then there's church leaks. You know, people are like, all about the dirt, all about the dirt. Ah, better not say that. And some of us, God is saying, hey, I want you in my family. I love you too much to let you feel alone, isolated, rejected, and lonely. I'm trying to bring some folks into your life who will love on you, but you got to help me help you. Because sometimes we're like that guy who's drowning. And God says the Coast Guard in a helicopter. And God sends a fisherman in a boat. And God sends a lifeguard to rescue him. And he's like, "Uh uh-uh, God's going to rescue me. He drowns and dies, and he meets God in heaven. And he's like, Lord, why didn't you rescue me? He's like, I tried. I said, the Coast Guard, I sent a fisherman, and I sent a lifeguard. What else do you want me to do? And sometimes we're asking God for help, and he's bringing it, but it comes disguised as a person who we don't necessarily click with. They're like, Lord, I feel so lonely and isolated. But then, any office fans? You can admit it. Come on. It's not Lion Church. (laughs) There you go. But then so God brings someone like Dwight into your life. If, you, if you're not an Office fan, then you got to find out Dwight because he's a, a very irregular other guy. So God brings someone like Dwight into your life, and you're like, can you bring somebody else? Like, God, do you really love me? He's like, yes, I do. But Dwight's going to help you in your character and help develop you to where I want you to be. God doesn't always bring the people who we want into our lives. Otherwise, he would always bring like the Kardashians and Bill Gates with all this money flowing in all the time. No, God brings who we need into our lives. Because love doesn't let you stay the same as you are. Any parents? You want your 35-year-old living in your basement all forever? No. No. No, you better say no. <laughs> Otherwise, you and I are going to have a conversation after the service. You don't want no 35-year-old living in your basement or in your, your spare bedroom in your backyard in a tent. You, you want that kid out, preferably well before 35. God's a good, good father, right? So he doesn't let us stay in his so-called basement for too long. Because he wants us to make the jump to his ultimate purpose for our lives. He loves you too much to let you stay the same. So if he's been bringing people into your life, circumstances into your life, then he's that good and he loves you that much. Because otherwise he'll just move on to somebody else. I wish they had those pictures because I've got this really crazy kind of picture about the goddess Diana. You got it? That's the goddess Diana. See that? And those little things that look like pomegranates, those aren't pomegranates. Those are actually breasts. Yeah, it was grotesque. And they had these all throughout the city of Ephesus. So everywhere you went, you saw these grotesque statues to the goddess Diana. So now you guys get the hint. And then there, that's the temple to the goddess Diana. A massive, the next one, it's a massive structure built in her honor, where thousands of priestesses would gather and all seven days a week would be worshiping her in that way. Exactly. It is sick, and it was. Romans 12.10, love one another with brotherly affection. I like this because some of us are very competitive. Outdo one another in showing honor. This is the one time the, the, the scripture says we can be competitive. No, not to see who's going to be most favored, but who see who's going to be most honorable, to see who's going to show the most honor upon our spiritual leaders, to see who's going to bring them their favorite coffee, and then the, the one who's going to bring them the larger cup of coffee, and then the one who's going to bring them two cups of coffee, and then the one who's going to bring them their subscription to coffee, and then the one who's going to drive them over to the coffee shop, and then the one who's going to pick them up for a foot massage, and then the one... 
who's going to outdo each other. There should be this competition to where when you see any of your leaders carrying stuff, it's like, no, I'll get it. Oh, no, I'll get it. Uh, no, I'll, no, I insist. I'll, okay, you get the stuff and I'll carry you. How about that? <laughs> Outdoing each other and showing honor. Because one of the things that we've gotten very wrong in our country is we have forsaken honor. We have not honored marriage. The God instituted relationships. We have not honored marriage. We've not honored each other. It's okay to now cancel somebody, to block somebody. Oh, you said something that got me butthurt and hurt my feelings? I'm going to cancel you. Where did that nonsense ever come into the picture? Let that never be said that any of us do that because I promise you God's not happy with you if you're doing that because God would never cancel any of us as knuckleheaded as we have been at times, and he still never cancels us. He still hears our prayers, and he still answers them. Let that never be said of any of us. And, it, and, and then you turn around and pray, God, bless me. He's like, I ain't going to bless you until you bless your neighbor. Because if you don't love your neighbor who you can't see, then you definitely don't love God who you can't, can't see. So let us not dishonor each other. Let us honor each other. Honor each other's presence. People matter most. Oh, I love that. People matter most. The only th things that we're bringing into eternity with us are not things. They're people. Relationships. The, the relationships that we foster here on this earth, on this side of eternity, those are the only things that we're bringing with us. We've dishonored Men, there's a war on men in our country. We've told men that we don't need them anymore. We've told men that women could do everything as good as them and don't even need them anymore. We've told them that they're insignificant except for bringing in a paycheck. We've gotten it wrong, and we expect God to bless it. God never said that men stopped being the authority figures, but he said, don't dishonor women either because they're really cool. He actually said for us uh, husbands that we're supposed to get spikes in our hands, nails in our feet, a crown of thorns on our head, be pierced in our side, be 39 lashes on our back, and be willing to die in the same manner as Christ died for his church for our wives. A bloody, brutal death. That's a difficult thing. <laughs> but he doesn't ask us to do that literally. He asks us to do that with our tongue, with our language, to not make cutting remarks, to not be insensitive towards her. It, and I'm talking to me. See, every, every time I speak, I'm, 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 I'm speaking in the mirror. <laughs> so I'm like, if, if I can't handle it, then why am I going to dish it out? You know what I mean? I'm never... We never, I've never been about that life. You know, I've never been that guy who's like dishing it out, dishing it out, and then you say one thing and I get all butthurt and walk away. No. If you want to go toe to toe, let's go toe to toe. Because the things that I say, I'm, the Lord's telling me and dealing with me. We've dishonored the institution of leadership. We've said things like, oh, only God can judge me. Yeah. But God also said that we're going to judge the angels. So clearly God has delegated judgment to his people. We've said things like, well, I can worship by myself at home. You can, but I never see Jesus doing that. So all I do is what my master modeled. It says that he was always in God's house. So if G since, not if, since Jesus did it, I'm just going to do what Jesus did, right? Simple as that. So can I worship at home by myself? Maybe. But why would I? Right? Any uh, sports fans? Don't, don't lie to me that you would rather stay home and watch it on TV. Do not lie to me. You would not rather stay home and watch it on TV. If somebody gave you your football fan 50-yard line tickets... 
or if you had the margin to afford those great seats with your favorite snacks and candy and, and soda and everything like that and watch the game right there, I promise you, you would not stay home. Well, we get a grand opportunity every week to not stay home. Why would we? Every single week for free. What you were charged a cover charge? Art, what are you doing back there? No wonder he's so happy. What? He said, slip me a 10 and we'll call it. No, no, no. No cover charge. <laughs> no. Doing it wrong. <laughs> for free every Sunday. Man, I don't know about you, but every single Sunday, even though I'm tired, man, it's like a kid on Christmas morning. I get to be in God's house. Man, I get to be with the people of God. Oh, I get to worship and lay down all my troubles and all my cares and all my worries and start the week off fresh right on the mountaintop where we belong. And there's no, no greater experience than coming and being with the people of God, people like yourselves. I like what the Prince of Preachers, Charles Spurgeon, said. He said, nothing reflects so much honor on a workman as a trial of his work and its endurance of it. So it is with God. It honors him when his saints preserve their integrity. What's he talking about? He's talking about being a whole person. And not having any area of your life missing. He's talking about being a person who honors the sacred traditions that he has established. He's talking about being somebody who every single day you are a person who gives honor. There, here's, here's the difference. We're very much a respect society. Respect is earned, right? But honor is given freely. Honor is given freely. You don't earn honor. You know how you get honor? It's just by being born. God's honoring you with life. He's honoring you with breath in your lungs and with opportunity and with freedom in our country. There's been more martyrs, more people killed because they are Jesus followers in the last hundred years than the previous 2,000 years prior to it. We don't hear that publicized, but it's the truth. There's more people who love Jesus nowadays than ever before. But we're insulated from that. There's no cops who are coming in here and raiding this place. But there's places like South, not North Korea. I'm getting my directions confused. North Korea, where it is illegal for Christians to own a Bible. If you are found with scripture, even a page, you will disappear and never be heard from again. The smugglers who bring Bibles into these places like communist China are never heard from again in many cases. But we have the freedom. God's given us freedom, guys, in our country. Beautiful, wonderful, glorious freedom. To open your Bible app on your phone, to open scripture. You know, one of the reasons why to some people God can get boring is because they have not embraced Him. See, boring Christians have dusty Bibles. Oh, wow, that was pretty good. I better say that again. <laughs> boring Christians have dusty Bibles. A Bible that has not been opened in a long, long time. And they're also the Christians who say, God's not talking to me. But they never opened the Bible. God's got 66 books of things to say to you every day of the year. Honor his word. Honor the church. Honor our leaders. Honor your boss. Stop bad-mouthing your boss. You're never going to get ahead in the workplace by doing that. Honor your boss. Not a brown noser, but a team player. Not a brown noser, but a peacemaker. So when others are bashing your boss, you're like, I'm not about that life. No, my boss is doing a great job. I may not agree with everything that he does. I may not agree all the time, but I'm still going to give him honor. Because that's who I am. You may not be about that, but I'm going to do that anyway. So while they're hanging around the water cooler or the coffee maker or whatever and bad-mouthing the boss, don't do that. 
Honor the boss. You know, boss, you're doing a great job. You know, boss, I appreciate you. You know, boss, I imagine that being a boss is hard, hard work that I don't even imagine. And I appreciate you for always making sure that I'm taken care of and for always being there for me. You know, boss, I know we don't always see eye to eye, but I'm, I'm thankful for you because you always deliver right when I need you to. So I appreciate you. I honor you. I honor your position. I honor the fact that God has placed you in that position. And then you don't tell the boss this, but if God wants you to have the boss's position, guess who's next in line? Not the bad mouther of the boss. The one who honors the boss. Let's be a people of honor who honor children. We honor up, down, and all around. We not only honor leadership, but we also honor children, those who are younger than us. We honor seniors. We honor people who can't give us anything in return. We honor them too. And if you're curious as to why I'm not stepping on that side, it's because it creaks very bad. Like, I'm in a haunted mansion, so I'm not going to step over there. Nothing against you guys. I don't want to shade you. In, you know, just in case you're like, why is he always going over there? Does he love them more? No comment. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it, it just creaks over there. Let's be a people of honor in everything that we do. The mechanic at the mechanic shop, man, thank you for doing such a great job. I honor you. I appreciate you. Man, you know, your parents, kids, you're not going to get anywhere by bad-mouthing your parents. Children, honor your mother and your father that you may live a long life on the earth. Honor them. Honor your parents, whether they're still alive or they're not. Whether you're still in your life or you're not, they're other, on the other side of the world or they're close by, honor your parents. Honor them. Appreciate them. Don't ever, let us never be a people who badmouth our parents or anyone older than us. Let's respect the institutions that God has established and honor. Always honor. I heard a song back in the day that's when death before dishonor. And it never resonated with me before until I got a little bit older. Not old, but just a little bit older than I used to be. <laughs> Death before dishonor. What does that mean? That, like King David said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O God, my Redeemer. That every day, that everybody who I come across, I would not be short with, I would not make cutting remarks with, but that I would seek to be a person who honors every person that I come across. And how do we do that in a very real way? By just acknowledging people. Hello, good morning. How are you? It doesn't mean that you have to be involved with everybody. That's impossible. You can't have a relationship with everybody. But you can acknowledge people. One of the things that we lost is a sense of honor towards our elders, a sense of respect. Honor has been lost. Man, I come across so many kids. They'll pass right by me. <laughs> the way that mama taught us is when we went to visit our family, the first thing that we did was we climbed those stairs and we said hello to grandpa. The very first thing. Before we said hello to anybody else. No, you go upstairs and you say hello to your grandpa. And we may have left Grandma and Grandpa's house late, but the last thing that we did before we left was go up those stairs again and say goodbye to Grandpa. We honored the man of the house. We honored the man of the house. See, we have not gotten far in our country because we've lost this sense of honor for our elders. Let's teach it to each other. Let's express it towards each other. And let's keep it in our heart of hearts that every day of my life, I'm going to be a person of honor. I heard a story about Babe Ruth. Anyone know Babe Ruth? You got Google, so. Um, <laughs> Babe Ruth, one of the greatest home run hitters in the history of baseball. Mind you, this is when original Yankee Stadium, the outfield fence was like 440 feet, and he was still hit it out of the park. And this was no steroid. The Babe was not roided up. He had no juice in him. All natural. Now, the babe had autographed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of baseballs in his career. But he only autographed seven bats. Seven. Siete. Pretty good Spanish for you. Seven. <laughs> and, and that's all I know. So, so when, when someone asks me, do you, do you speak Spanish? I say, no quito. 
because I don't even speak a little. Just no quito. Anyway, no quito. So I, all, I don't do quito either, so it hasn't done that. Anyway, so the babe, seven bats in his entire career. Well, they only found six. And baseball historians had wondered what happened to number seven. Nobody knew. So in, it, it turned up in 1988. It turned out that this elderly gentleman had held this bat under his bed for like 18 years. And it was passed down through the generations to him from his like great grandpa or something like that. And nobody knew. Nobody knew that he had it. There was a nurse, because he had in-home hospice, a nurse who he was so appreciative of that he actually gave her the bat to show his appreciation to her as his dying wish. Now, the bat, because she always had a dream of opening a restaurant, she sold the bat at auction in 2006 for $1.6 million dollars. And a portion of the proceeds she used to open her restaurant, and then the rest she donated to a children's foundation because the babe always had a soft spot for kids. And this is what she said. Marcia Napoli Tejeda. The bat was only valuable because Babe Ruth's name was on it. Since he made it valuable, the only reasonable thing I could do was something that would honor his life. That bat was only valuable because the babe's name was on it. Otherwise, it was just an ordinary Louisville slugger bat. You and I, you know why we're valuable? It's not because of our last name, but it's because of who our daddy is. because he's placed his name on us and he signed our hearts with his signature. That's how valuable that every single one of us is. So let us always be a people of honor. Every head bowed and every eye closed. You might be in this place and for some reason you're far from God. Maybe at one time you were living for him, you were going hard after God, all in. But then you lost sight for whatever reason things happen and you just lost sight of your relationship with him. Today, he's saying he wants you back because you're his child and he loves you. Or maybe you never served God. You've never gone all in in a relationship with Jesus. But you say, you know, something that you said spoke to me. It, it, it resonated with me. And you say, that's me. I want to come home. I want to be a child of God as he has given me the right to be. Then with every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm just going to ask you for, to lift up your hand on the count of three if that's you. One, two, three. Just lift up your hand and you say, that's me. Pray with me. Pray with me. I see that hand. God bless you. God bless you, ma'am. I see that hand. God bless you, ma'am. I see that hand. If you could just hold it up for a second, sir. I see that hand. One of our ushers is going to place a card in your hand. God bless you. Put it down. Anybody else? You say, pray with me. I want to come back home. I want to be close to God again. I want to be his child and come back into his family. Then for those of you who raised your hands, we're going to pray. And if you are a Jesus follower already, then please pray. Let's all pray this prayer together to support those who have raised their hands today. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you died and you rose again three days later. Forgive my sins and give me the strength to live for you every day. I turn away from my old life and I turn to my new life in you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you would cover these commitments today. Lord, I pray that you would guard them against every single thing that the enemy would try to use against them to discourage, distract, or in any way disrupt their commitment to you. I pray that you would cover them in your keeping power, and God, that they would come to experience your love and your mercy and your kindness in great and greater ways every single day. In Jesus' name. 
I'm going to call our prayer leaders forward this morning. If you'd like to spend a moment or two in the Lord's presence before we dismiss, then feel free to do so. Come, come and seal this word in your heart. If you'd like to get prayer, then go up to one of them. If you'd like to just spend a moment in God's presence, then we're all going to stand today and sing this song. And as we sing the song one time through and you need to be dismissed, then you can consider yourself dismissed. But we're going we're gonna to come and we're going to seal this word in our hearts as we sing that song this morning.